Technology and luxury fashion, they sound like two entirely different worlds. Catwalks and algorithms, or clothing designers and web creators. They're arguably polar opposites. So what happens when these two industries collide, especially when they're under pressure to step up the fight against climate change? On this episode of Leaders with L'Aqua Goes Green, I speak to the tech entrepreneur who's transforming luxury retail. Jose Neves is a former shoe designer with a passion for all things digital. He eventually founded the online shopping platform Farfetch, a marketplace for some of the most desirable labels and boutiques across the globe. He joined me from New York, where Farfetch made its stock market debut in 2018. Jose, thank you so much for joining us on Leaders with L'Aqua. Now, you became an entrepreneur really young. You started uh, Farfetch or thinking about Farfetch when we were very young. Do you remember the first memory, the earliest memory of you saying, I want to go into business, I want to have my own business? That was very, very um, early age, actually. I, uh, I started playing with computers, coding when, when I was eight, actually. I, I got a little... Uh, ZX Spectrum is actually a British uh, <laughs> uh, vintage uh, <laughs> computing machine uh, when I was um, eight for Christmas and it didn't come with any games so I had to the only thing I could do with it was was code and I, I remember absolutely falling in love with uh, with coding and, uh, and and this was you know the early 80s and and we were in Europe all witnessing from afar the big battle between Steve Jobs and, and Bill Gates and, and software, you know, changing the world and technology really um, completely revolutionizing every, and this was pre-internet even. But uh, I remember thinking as a little kid and as a teenager, I would love to be part of, uh, of that uh, revolution. And, uh, and I had this, you know, fixation with one day uh, running a tech business. And, and that's what well, that's what I did when I was 19. Yeah, it's amazing, Jose. So you're 19, and what made you go in, into fashion? So you decide, you know, maybe when you're eight, I want to go into something that's techy, that's cool, like Steve Jobs. But then you have this idea of building a platform for luxury, for fashion. What was behind that? Um, I think, you know, it's really uh, the fact that I was born in the, in the, north, of Portugal, uh, in the north of Portugal, and uh, it's a, a fashion cluster. Uh, my grandfather had a shoe factory. My parents were working class um, professionals, like my mother was a maths teacher, my father was a, a pharmaceutical rep. Um, and so it jumped one generation. But that um, fashion bug was in the family. And when I started um, developing software, the natural clients that we were um, starting to develop solutions for were fashion businesses. And that got me into the, the factories and into the, the world of design, creativity, the world of fashion. And that was a second passion because in the beginning it wasn't about fashion, it was really about technology. And then when I was 22, I moved to London to start a shoe brand and I became a, um, a self-taught, <laughs> not very good shoe designer. <laughs> and, um, and actually the brand was quite successful. So I had this technology business and I had this very incipient starting, like very new up and coming brand. And so those, those were the, 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 the small beginnings. I know you, you believe your journey has been ups and downs as an entrepreneur, and often it's more downs than ups, but people don't realize. Do you remember a particularly down moment and what it took to overcome that as an entrepreneur? Uh, look, I, I think you're, you're absolutely right. It's, uh, it's really uh, more, more downs than, than ups. It's like a, uh, the, the metaphor that's coming to my head is like a game of blackjack, right? So you lose, 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 and then you have a <laughs> hit a 21, and then you lose, 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 and you have to be really patient. Um, and, but I, I remember, you know, many very difficult moments. Actually, in fact, at the beginning of Farfetch, I, I, started, I had the idea in 2007. Uh, we launched in October 2008, and two weeks later, Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, and, you know, we had the, the, the global financial meltdown. And, uh, and the plan was to start with my own money. I didn't have any, any co-founders, mm -hmm. any investors. So I started with, uh, and the idea was, okay, let's prove that we can create a platform, sign the boutiques, have a good consumer traction, and surely there will be venture capital. Um, mm -hmm. Well, uh, not really. Actually, our, our first venture capital investor, uh, a guy called Frédéric Cour, 
uh, was in 2010. So we were from 2007 to 2010, um, you know, basically running the business um, uh, with loans from the shoe business into the tech business. It was like a, a very, very uh, tight spot uh, from a cash flow perspective. But did you ever doubt? As human beings, we, we doubt is, is an important part uh, of our psychological process. Um, but it's, it's how, always how you manage to balance a healthy dose of doubt with, um, uh, you know, I always say your mind will paint negative scenarios. That's what it's supposed to do. Um, and you should accept it and embrace it. But your mind can also paint the positive scenarios if you specifically ask your mind to do that. It has to be an active exercise. Uh, and then you, you, you start to have a perspective and, and I think that's important in, in anyone's professional life. Jose, what's the hardest bit in, in those down moments as an entrepreneur? Is there an instinct that says, actually, I'm going to change strategy? Is there an instinct of saying, actually, I can't take this? Is there something that you need to overcome to make sure that there's an up shortly afterwards? I mean, we are more resilient as human beings than what we think we are, right? And we have something which is called survival instinct, if you want, which, which you know, in very difficult periods, um, uh, we become more creative. We always say necessity is a matter of invention. I think it's very true. And, uh, and we always find ways that we didn't um, expect before and, and, and the world starts presenting us with solutions that we didn't consider before. So I think that's one thing. But the other is, is real passion around the long-term vision and mission. Because if you, if you really are doing something, not just for the financial benefit of it, but something that is deeper and, and is more um, fundamental to you and, uh, and, 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 and you can you really build a company with a sense of mission and long-term vision, I think that's what takes uh, companies through the, um, through, the, through the ups and downs. So what motivates you? If you look at the company, what you've achieved so far, how do you measure success? Look, okay, I think personally what motivates me um, is creativity, um, is inventing things. Um, and, and that's why I love the two spaces. I love technology, which is about improving how people do things and, and revolutionizing entire industries and making the world um, a different place um, for, for the improvement of, um, in our case, a specific ecosystem of s small and, and large companies. And then the creative side of things, fashion is something that personally um, I love to be in this, in, the, in this intersection of these two worlds. And, and the measure of success, I think it's, it's really long-term uh, milestones and, and how, how you advance towards those uh, whilst obviously, I always say, you know, keep your eyes firmly on the North Star, but your feet also firmly on the ground. So that balance between um, reality and running, um, you know, in a very pragmatic way, um, a business, uh, but without ever forgetting like the, 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 the vision, the long-term vision. Coming up, Jose tells me how he's positioning the company to prosper in a sustainable fashion. Luxury retail has surprised many by offering a port in the storm amid the pandemic, inflation, and a slowdown in discretionary spending. But things have not always been plain sailing since the company went public in 2018. The Farfetch boss tells me about the ups, the downs, and the efforts to go green. Farfetch seems a lot more like a platform than other e-commerce luxury websites. Is that a strength or is that a weakness in 2023? I think, you know, we are, we are definitely a platform business. Um, our mission is to be the global platform for luxury. Um, we, everything we do, we think as a platform. So um, the way we develop our technology, which um, obviously we use on the Farfetch app and on the Farfetch um, websites around the world, um, that same technology, it's built in a way that other companies, other businesses can leverage it to run their own um, digital strategies under their own brand. So going forward, and this is something that, you know, we've, we've tried to explore quite a lot on, on this program and others. If you look at LVMH, the world's uh, most important company in terms of value at the moment, this is also about in-shop experiences. It's Avenue Montaigne and some of the things that they've built around Browns. So in five, 10 years, what does the luxury shopping experience look like in your eyes? 
Um, that's that's a, a, a great question, a question that, that it's at the core um, of, of really what we do. I always say the most important question is how will people shop for fashion in the next five to ten years. And I think it's going to be physical and digital. And if you look at most analysts, they think um, online penetration is more or less around 20%. Um, today, normalized after COVID, COVID was a bit higher. Um, and in a few years' time, it will be anywhere between 25, 30, uh, some people think even higher. Um, so there, there will be a strong um, presence of digital channels, uh, but, but physical retail is not going to, um, to go away. So uh, for me, the next big frontier is how these two converge. And you also have, of course, a, a portfolio of brands called the New Guards, which includes Off-White. So you're, you have you know, many different parts of the business. Is there one, is this almost like a natural hedge, depending on which way it will go, or do you see them you know, blending more into one? How, how will Farfetch change in five years? Uh, we, we see this as... Um, a flywheel, uh, these three business pillars. So one is, we call it marketplaces. So this is the most visible part of Farfetch, right? When you download our app, you're, you're really, um, you're really um, experiencing that, that part of the business. Then we have Farfetch platform solutions. If you want to use the mm -hmm. Amazon example, that would be our AWS, right? So this is how brands mm -hmm. can utilize the likes of Cartier, the likes of Harris, brands and retailers, they can utilize our um, platform to white label it to uh, build their own digital strategies. Um, and then the third pillar of our strategy is our own original content. So these are uh, new concepts, new creatives, new cultural relevant voices that we power uh, vertically um, and give them also a digital direct to consumer distribution channel. Because I believe, um, and this you could call it the Netflix of luxury, right? So Netflix, what's right. beautiful about that company is that it discovered Korean talent and got us all to, to watch um, Squid Game. I think it's the name of the, of the series, isn't it? I mean, that's unthinkable in a pre-Netflix world where Hollywood absolutely dominated, right? So I believe that in fashion, you will have this wave of new creatives, new talent, that thanks to digital distribution channels, they can really leapfrog many, many years and the usual buildup of what is a traditional fashion ecosystem um, and go direct to consumer in a powerful digital way. Of course, that benefits the right. marketplace uh, because if we have more original content, we create organic traffic engagement, which improves our economics. So you're talking almost like an ecosystem. I imagine what you need is people to, of course, you know, buy the products, preferably buy them at full price, and especially not return them. How difficult is that? Um, at the core of, of the Farfetch uh, brand is our unrivaled um, range. So we have a very curated marketplace. So you don't have a page on Farfetch where you can become a seller. Uh, we will find you mm -hmm. and we will invite you. So it's by invitation only. But Jose, do you worry, I mean, if, if I buy, I don't know, a jacket, a dress, then it may not fit, I don't like the material, and then I return it. H how often does that happen? And is there anything that you can do to actually limit that? It's not usually, if I go to a store, I try it on store, but online, of course, it's, it's, a, it's a different thing. And I keep on hearing from e-commerce giants and saying that's actually their biggest concern is people returning things, and maybe they buy five items and return four. We, we haven't seen returns go up, actually. It's been pretty... Uh... Um, consistent and, and stable over the years. Um, uh, it, it is in, it's actually for us returns, we don't break it out, but it's a very low number for e-commerce standards. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but is, it is a double digit percentage of sales, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's be clear. And it is an environmental problem as well. Uh, so it's not just a customer experience problem and, uh, and the financial impact. Uh, but of course it's an environmental um, concern. So everything we can do to, de to, to improve, um, you know, feeding information, um, use virtual try-on, so we've um, developed and actually acquired a virtual try-on company uh, where we're um, being very successful with things like sneakers mm -hmm. and shoes, for example. Um, uh, we're doing virtual try-on across a number of categories, including beauty, for example. But um, but things like virtual try-on, things like using artificial intelligence um, to figure out what your size is based on past um, consumer behavior and past uh, purchases and returns, 
these things are very powerful and, and in fact right. we've seen that they consistently have an impact on a positive impact on the lower level of returns. We're here to talk about sustainability and so you mentioned returns but actually it's pretty incredible this the the fashion industry as a whole because of some of the processes is about you know responsible for two to eight percent of greenhouse gas emissions that's greater than all international flights maritime and shipping combined. I know you care personally about sustainability is there a, a, a turning point for fashion to reckon with how much you know, the, the, they're causing to the environment and an introspection of what they can do. Yes, uh, I, I think it is a very serious uh, problem that, that needs to be addressed um, actually collectively at an industry level. I, I'm, um, I was very honored to be invited by François Ripineau, the ch chairman and CEO of Caring, to be part of the Fashion Pact. The Fashion Pact is um, uh, um, a community of uh, some of the largest luxury brands but also not just luxury and and retailers and we're really coming together at CEO level um, to work on a number of collective initiatives because this has to be solved individually and collectively so both need to happen. Coming up Jose Neves reveals how his company's data shows booming demand for sustainable clothing and how luxury retailers can ride the wave. Luxury shopping platform Farfetch is at the intersection of tech and fashion, which provides both limitations and immense opportunities to help create a greener planet. Neves tells me why companies should not be judged on their different approaches to the clean energy transition. So, Jose, what would you do first? I mean, if you look at the usage of water, 250 trillion liters of water per year are consumed by the fashion industry. Can that be addressed? In terms of flights, the, what are your priorities to try and kickstart and spearhead this movement for the rest of the fashion industry? Absolutely. I, I think, you know, um, certain areas we have less impact. For example, the usage of water, because apart from NGG, which is a very relatively small part of our business, um, we actually do not produce um, these products. Um, however, there are other areas, for example, logistics, uh, where we can absolutely make a difference. So, for example, in terms of um, making sure that all our packaging is uh, recyclable, uh, making sure that uh, we optimize domestic shipping and local shipping. That's why we have shipping from 50 countries I don't think any company, certainly in our space, has shipping from 50 countries. So that if we can ship locally, we avoid, um, we avoid shipping cross-border. Um, so there, there are things like this. Um, also an investment on circular fashion. I, I, th I really believe that one of the biggest problems in our industry is overproduction. Less in luxury than in fast fashion or more mainstream fashion, but still there is a problem. And I think if we can make sure that a product product's life is extended as much as possible, that goes a long way towards solving the problem. So we were one of the first um, and, and one of the first multi-brand platforms that, that sells new products to incorporate pre-owned and resale many, many years ago. And, and that is becoming a bigger area of, of our business. Um, then it's about empowering consumers with the power of choice. So we have this yeah. Um, uh, this rating, so we have a conscious edit at Firefetch, so it's a filter mm -hmm. that as a customer you can buy only conscious products if you want and they're rated not by us, by right. a third party agency that rates every brand and every product. That in turn is driving brand so, behavior because we can share those yeah. insights with brands and steer them in the right direction. So it's things like that that are, are very important for us. So let's unpack that a little bit. When you look at, you know, secondhand vintage usage, how big do you think that market will be for the industry and specifically for Farfetch going forward? It's a market that, uh, that we're very excited about and we've been growing uh, this category within Farfetch faster than what we're growing the, the, any other, well, the rest of other categories, the average of, of the marketplace. So it's been gaining weight within Farfetch and that's what we, the way we want it. Um, and, um, and also the conscious edit that I just mentioned, people shopping for conscious products, that's working. So consumers, are, um, uh, consumers that shop conscious products are growing much faster than the average of the marketplace. 
This is very important because we can go back to the brands and say, look, if you do the right thing, consumers will appreciate and will provide you with very, very granular data at product level on what is important for consumers and how much consumers are willing to pay for it. So people want to buy more conscious and you see it absolutely in the data that actually as a consumer, they'll yes. forego brands that are not conscious. They will buy more if they believe that uh, that product in specific and that brand is good for the for the environment. So when you look at you know how much value of some of these things is lost because of lack of recycling or overproduction, I think it's about 500 billion dollars every year. Again, what can your industry do to actually get better at that? So not have overstock. I think a number of things. For example, um, uh, all the way from changing the supply chain to made to order, right? I really believe that um, in, in today's world, it is possible not to have to produce something before the consumer buys it, right? So, so that would be a complete revolution because then theoretically you would have you would go down to no overproduction apart from the customer not liking, in the end, not liking the product, right? So you, you really cut short um, a lot of the overproduction problem. Um, and we have, um, we have done initiatives in terms of made to order, uh, both on Firefetch and with other um, investments that even I personally made um, in, in the space. So uh, I think that's one, one step. Then another, um, another step is, is really circularity. Uh, repair mm -hmm. services, for example. So this is something that we've um, trialed and, and I believe it's very important. So if you can extend the life of your pair of shoes, even if you, if for, even for your own use, things like pre-owned and resale, uh, which again, as we yeah. touched, and, and, uh, and actually an appreciation of craftsmanship and quality. And I think here mm -hmm. luxury is very positioned. You know, I have, I have jackets that I've, I've had for 10 years and they're still they're still perfectly in good condition, right? And so if you buy a high quality, which could be maybe a higher price item, um, that's better for the environment than buying 10, you know, lower quality products. So, right, yeah. so I'll also uh, explain it to the customer that um, it's, it's worth um, having investment pieces and, and investing in, in uh, longevity. Um, Jose, do, do you think you can be a leader actually in 2023 without thinking about the environment? Can one even be a, a non-green leader nowadays? I think, you know, like we, we have to do what we feel is right for us personally and our businesses. And um, um, so, you know, like different businesses will move at different speeds and there should be no judgment. I think we should have a positive attitude about this. Or for example, we tell brands, this is what consumers are doing. And it's up to you, right? Okay. So you will make the final decision. Okay, so I'm going to ask you, what's the, what's the worst piece of advice that you ever received? Well, I think, you know, it's always when, uh, you know, actually, uh, uh, you know, and being a public company, you have to be uh, ready to, uh, to read things that you like and read things that you don't like. But in fact, there's always an element of truth, right? So even in <laughs> the, the, the less constructive or people that understand or you feel that they understand your business less than, than what they could, uh, there will be an element of truth. Yeah, but you've never, no one's ever told you something crazy that you just thought like you're, you're crazy? No, because uh, uh, they're not crazy. <laughs> they're not crazy. You know, they, are, they, are, they have a view of the world which can be partial. Maybe they don't have all the information. Uh, but based on the information they have, that's how they're seeing it. And that should be respected. So um, it doesn't mean that we agree with it. It doesn't mean that we um, uh, are going to immediately act upon things that we don't think are well informed okay. and constructive. But, but that's how they see the world. We should pay attention, I, I believe. Okay. Jose, thank you so much. I was thank giving you. crazy advice, so we'll have to go for a drink and discuss that. <laughs> thank you, Jose. <laughs>